Do, like, what? Hello, sisters. Also, what is with the timestamps? Because in the last video, I started saying, like, you know, like, the title of the book and, like, which part and the essay and everything. And then suddenly, like, the time of the live stream, like, jumped backwards. So I'm like, did the beginning get cut off? Alternately, this is the opposite, where it's like nothing shows up for the live. And then suddenly the timestamp shows up and it's like you've been live for nine seconds. Like how? I don't know when the actual fucking live stream starts. Anyway, here we are. Hello. Um, not to like reprimand you because like I'm not your mom or your teacher or whatever. But I was like a little bit disappointed that like so few women tuned in today because I think this is probably like my most favorite essay in the book so far. I was like when I went through every time I start a new book on my channel, I go into Canva and I make like the thumbnails for each thing and then I go also through the length of the essays or the chapters and make sure that they like are reasonable for like one reading or not um like I have this other book feminist epistemologies which I think we're gonna read next year because it's pretty dense um and uh that one almost every essay is gonna be two readings because they're like really long and dense anyway when I went through the in Canva and like did all the thumbnails and like, you know, looked at like how long each essay was. This was the essay I was most looking forward to. Um, and like, I wish that like 50 fucking women had tuned in so that they could all have their thoughts in the live chat. Pulse person, great. <laughs> she says, everyone who didn't show up for class is getting an F, yes. Um, oh my gosh, also, okay. I don't know how reliable this data is, but I was looking in like my YouTube analytics um, which they have made very accessible on the YouTube creator app. And apparently 100% of my YouTube audience in the last month has been female. So like shout out to you guys. Good job. The Miss Andre or whatever. A plus. Amazing. Okay. Um, yeah. Like I kind of suspected that was the case just because A, I talk about like boring academic shit, right? Like, I think unless you're actually interested, you're not going to sit through all of my super long live streams. And also because, like, I speak to the audience as if you're only women. And I think to men that would get, like, pretty annoying pretty fast. And they wouldn't have the patience to put up with that just to, like, hate on me. I have in the past had, like, I think it was last, like, season of live streams. I did have one guy who was, like, spam spamming my email every single day. And it was clear because he was that he was watching live streams because he would, like, quote them. And then, like, tell me how I'm stupid and, like, I don't understand. And, like, if I just, like, got fucked by a guy or something, I would, like, stop my silly feminism or, like, whatever. I don't fucking know. Uh, I obviously just, like, blocked him and never mentioned him on the live stream to give him attention. But, like, yeah, very happy with that. Very cool. Um, I have so many fucking thoughts. I want to speak for, like, four hours on this, which actually makes me think I should write, like, a response essay. Maybe response is not the right word, but a kind of like complimentary essay or like not in terms of like complimenting, but in terms of like connecting, like, I don't know which is the right word to use, but I kind of want to write like an essay inspired by this essay. It was so fucking good. Uh, I fucking loved it. I hope you loved it. Um, I think I'm also going to read this in a Twitter space and like have a discussion about it. I don't know though, like it took 35 minutes to read it. So might only get women there for like the ending who really wanted a discussion. Anyway, I don't know, I fucking loved it. A plus essay. Oh, also, what was the essay that she mentioned that was like this essay that like was inspired by Sarah Hoagland? Was it the to be and be seen? Okay, so we've already read it on here. Yeah, like, I know that I'm so obsessed with her, but I think we're going to reread the politics of reality like next season because I think there's so much stuff in there. Like even reading this, which talks about like seasoning women for heterosexuality, habituating them, naturalizing heterosexuality, all that stuff. Like when you read, she has like an entire essay on how like women are like conditioned into being seasoned, into being like sexually subservient and therefore like socially and like behaviorally subservient to men and that this is like the easiest way for men to dominate women instead of like doing it by force um like on mass or like on force by like a one-to-one -one scale like one man per woman if they like habituate women into it they don't need to like go out of their way to force us to be subservient because it's like we've been trained to do it like naturally 
like all that kind of stuff that she mentions in here, like in passing, like the entire essays are dedicated to it in the last book. And I think like the more kind of like philosophical background we have, the more real world stories we have that relate to that, those essays will take on a deeper meaning to us if we reread them. Also, that was one of the first books I ever read on my channel. I think I've gotten better at reading. So I feel like I should like, you know, give it another go. Anyway, okay, the essay. So there's a few things right off the top of my head that I want to mention before we get like into things like nitty gritty one by one. Um, <laughs> so first of all, uh, I thought that <laughs> TLDR, I thought that she was going to be like, you don't have to be, I guess she kind of was like this, but it was so much more nuanced. I thought she was going to, I assumed she was going to be like, you don't have to be a lesbian to be a feminist, but you can't be heterosexual and claim to be a feminist at the same time. But of course, this is why we love Marilyn. She's like, no, let's be like imaginative. Let's be hopeful. Let's be compassionate and realistic. And like, you know, like a radical answer to the question rather than a straightforward answer to the question. Fucking yes. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, I'm going to try so fucking hard to see her this summer. Like, I don't know if it's really possible, but I am going to be in the same city as her at at least one point. And I want to just be like, can I like buy you coffee and you sign my books or something? <laughs> like, I don't know. Uh, yeah, kitty cat. The answer is probably not what you were thinking it's going to be. Um, a friend says the way she explained the virgin concept was so beautiful. Yes, honestly, we need to read like an entire fucking book about this concept of virginity. Wasn't there one of the things she referenced in the note at the end? Oh, no, that was the gynophobia. Which book is that? Disloyal to Civilization, Feminism, Racism, and Gynophobia on Lies, Secrets, and Silence. But who the fuck is the author of that? 273 to 310. See, also, is this... Who is the... Is, if she doesn't list the author, does that mean she's the author? Because at another point when she references her own essay, she also lists herself as the author. So I'm confused about who that wrote. Let's should we Google it. I don't know. I just I thought she mentions the term gynophobia. I like that. Um, I also okay. I guess we're not going to really go super in order. I'm just going to like throw out all my thoughts as they come to me because there was a few like big brain thoughts I had before we get into the nitty gritty. So the first thing I liked was I liked when she uses the term like naturalize or like. She also used like a different version of the word natural. Yeah, anyway, I like how she uses the term naturalize because in a lot of ways, what she's referring to is what is colloquially now in internet rhetoric referred to as compulsory heterosexuality. I don't like that term for a few reasons. One, because like it has been so fucking overused and diluted that it doesn't really mean anything anymore. Or that it's like, it's kind of an impossible term to use for effective communication because it means so many different things to so many different people in different contexts, right? So... I don't like that. But the concept at its core is that women are conditioned as she habituated, seasoned, you know, like there's like a reward punishment system in place to force women to, into heterosexuality. So much so that it seems to most women inconceivable that they are not going to take part in that system and enjoy taking part in that system. Like that's what the term compulsory heterosexuality is supposed to mean. I like how here, she does reference Rich once. I'm sure, you know, based on the year this was written, that she had read the essay and had discussions with her friends about the essay. But compulsory heterosexuality by Adrian Rich is what I'm talking about. But when she uses the term naturalized, she kind of cuts through the shit. And she's like naturalizing, making it seem like it's inevitable and part of nature. Um, I think she explained so fucking well. Like, 
I also, some of the run-on sentences in this are like the longest run-on sentences I've ever seen in my life. But there's punctuation, like there's dashes or there's like semicolons. So it's like, it is a run-on sentence, but it's doesn't, it's not annoying to me. <laughs> uh, Uh, but yeah, she's like, the way she describes heterosexuality, so this is also, I find language so fucking annoying, like I was saying, I need to make a feminist dictionary, or like, start the project of like, a group feminist dictionary, whatever, heterosexuality, she is not referring to heterosexuality in this essay as who I'm attracted to, who I am like, oriented towards having relationships with. She is referring, the term heterosexuality in this essay refers to the behavior, right? And she's saying that the behavior is, she's not referring it to it as a self-directed, like, following on your own instinct and impulse behavior. She's referring to it as, like, a very, like, macro, political, like, this is the thing that happens when there is males in power. Women have sex with men when males are in power. Women become a communal sexual property to men a man individually or groups of men she uses like their clan kin or family at one point to reference like the the variety of sexual availability that women are expected to be to the men who own them i also i like how so she i think that that's like very instructive to a feminist discussion about heterosexuality again the behavior not the orientation i think that a lot of law online rhetoric when it comes to like separatism or like political celibacy or like you know all of these things that are like really contentious and like intense in online um, discussions the whole fucking conversation is kind of pointless because as soon as you use the term lesbian or heterosexual what women hear is who do i want to have sex with discussions <clears throat> discussions about political power and um exploitation do not start and end with what you want, right? Like, what you want is actually kind of irrelevant from a, as a starting point. It's not irrelevant completely, obviously, but as a starting point, it's kind of fucking irrelevant. Like, you know, this is like a great, like, that's, it's just part of feminist analysis, right? Like, you can say that you really, really want to have children. Okay, good. But is that a good starting point to discuss the exploitation of motherhood? No. Like, the exploitation of motherhood should be discussed in, like, a kind of, like, unemotional, factual sense. And after you have all of that kind of, like, understanding, discussion, criticism nailed down, then you can say, okay, now let's introduce the fact that I want to be a mother into, like, the things we already know. So, like, when I see these discussions of, like, political celibacy or, like, lesbian separatism or, like, political lesbianism or whatever online, they're just like, well, I like having sex with men. And I'm like, okay, so fucking what? Like... I like having sex with women like that's kind of irrelevant to the discussion of does society expect both you and I regardless to be sexually subservient to men yes like our desire doesn't enter into the equation of political power and like power dynamics and structures and all this like the perpetuation of like this naturalization um so I just, I love the way that she had, she used like one paragraph, two paragraphs to just like cut through and be like, this is what I mean when I say heterosexuality. The sexual servitude and uh, yeah, it's in this section here. And right, I like how she also like, while she's discussing that, she groups in like she, she kind of takes a step back and she references this in the final notes where she's like, another woman suggested to me that what I'm describing is like wifery or like wives. Like that's what I was describing. But actually in like the modern American culture at the time that she, in the 90s when she wrote this, the role that a wife took on didn't necessitate marriage anymore. Like, so if you think about what is a wife, right? in like the standard understanding historically of what that is is someone who's like sexually available to a guy has his children raises his children does the house labor like that's kind of like the four main th and 
the main maybe the most important thing is like under the control slash protection because those things are like a fucking paradoxical bullshit of that man right so her basically her argument is that like i won't use the term wife because it will like distract from the conversation what i'm describing is that but we know right now that women are doing that without like the legal like aspect of the wifery so she's like let's not fuck with that let's like cut through the shit just like fucking love you thanks marilyn um yeah, so I think I love how clear cut this was. And I love how when she's describing like heterosexual connections or like erotic encounters or whatever, she also adds like sexual slavery right after it. Because like, let's not fucking forget A, what being a wife or being the sexual property of a man is outside of the West, most of the time, or even in the West, a lot of the time, okay? And B, let's not forget the fucking historical context in which the word wife was fucking, like, the epistemology, or sorry, etymology of the word wife. Like, it's to be a fucking, like, sex slave that's owned by a particular man. That's what the wife is. And Choice feminism has basically completely obscured this very real concept that um, yeah, I don't know. The, just the entire concept of like sexual orientation. I have read some stuff by political lesbians in the recent past and you guys, like, you know me, right? When I go into a reading, I try to give the author the benefit of the doubt. And even if I know I'm going to disagree with them, I try to see things from their perspective so I can, like, you know, challenge it from my perspective, you know, like that kind of thing. And one of the things that I keep agreeing with the political lesbians on is, like, this idea of sexuality as innate is not true. And that's what she's fucking talking about here when she's, like, naturalizing heterosexuality. It, I think that this concept is actually not that hard to understand, like, especially if you come at this from, like, a gender-critical, like, anti-TRA perspective. So something that I think every single gender-critical woman would agree with is that no girl is born with a desire for pink bows and, like, Barbies or whatever. Like, no girl is born with a desire from birth to, like, cook in the kitchen all day for her husband and children, right? That this might be a thing that you want one day. But obviously society played a part in you getting there, right? If you can understand that no woman is born to perform a certain role based on the gendered expectations of our society, then you should be able to understand that no woman is born to be sexually subservient, to be in sexual servitude, to be in, like socially exploited. Like no woman is born to that. It's a thing that we are all taught. So if you understand the institution of heterosexuality, a.k.a. the, like, um, punishment, reward system, and the um, conditioning that leads women into heterosexual behavior and, like, heterosexual partnerships, then, like, it kind of fucking makes sense that this is a social problem. This is not a problem of instinct and intuition and attraction and all of this. This is a problem of, like, Society and civilization. Which I like she puts it in, in scare quotes. Civilization <laughs> in the essay. Um, yeah. So I like that a lot. Uh, okay. Yeah. Naturalized. There was one other. There was one other language, like like a specific word that she used that I was like, fuck, I love that. Obviously, virgin. Virgin that she uses to mean an autonomous woman. Fucking love that shit. Um, you know, there actually was like a school of detrans women from like 2013 to 2015 who got together and they wrote a zine and stuff like that. I know Paul's a person. She now has a copy of that zine. They referred to themselves as autonomous women, not as D-trans women, not as like re-identified women or like, I mean, they did use re-identified because to them they meant in terms of like male identified in like, in like the 1980s feminism kind of way, like in terms of like what, I, what value system you attribute yourself to or whatever. Right. Um, but they use the term autonomous women to describe themselves because they were like, 
we are women who are defining ourselves for ourselves, by ourselves, like in our own way, they were kind of embodying the virgin thing that she's describing. I mean, most of them, I think, were like lesbians, you know. But uh, the autonomous women, they were like, in some ways, the manifestation of what she was imagining the virgin, capital V, virgin to be from this essay, which is so fucking cool. Um, I kind of want to message some of them and be like, did you read this essay? Did that like take part in like why you came up with this term for yourselves? Because anyway, um, yeah, fucking radical. Uh, okay, so what was that other word? Virgin was a word that we liked. It was another fucking word that I was like, yes. Undomesticated woman. I liked that a lot. I should just stop and write shit down when I'm reading because like I this is like I don't know if it's like an ADHD thing or just a me thing or like a woman thing or what but as I'm reading I'm like oh my god that's so interesting I'll never forget that and then I fucking forget it um no I think let's give up on whatever that word was I can't remember it now okay so let's start from the beginning. Um, do you have sticky tabs? Actually, maybe. You guys would get a kick out of seeing my room. I recently organized it and it is organized, but everything is like in clear bins. So it's like organized where it looks really messy, but I know where everything is now. So I have a bin of like things that belong on a desk because my desk is covered in other crap. Um, no, okay, good call, guys. Um, I will try to remember that. Okay. Um, Kitty Cat says, kind of like thinking everyone has a false belief of heterosexual determinism. Mm -hmm. Turf Mail says, um, I would really like it laid out on a white board like maths in terms of definitions, connections, because I found it hard to keep it all straight. Yeah. Um, I'm like, I like having the paper book because I can like go back and look through it. Um, Maybe I'll write like a cliff note, cliff notes of this. Cause I found this like fucking so illustrative. Um yeah, okay. Um so let's go through like section by section. Also, it's hard, like I don't really know how to um illustrate this while I'm reading. But there are so many like page like page breaks like this where like it like there's like a like a large capitalized section like there's so many sections like this throughout one of her essays that i read before i actually said like page break because there was like ellipses and then a capital like that but they're like on the last page it happens like three freaking times in one page like i'm not sure and it's clear that she's like moving on to like a separate like topic or like like it's like okay I've made that point, next point kind of thing. Um, not really sure how to illustrate it as a, as a narrator, but yeah. Um, okay. So the first section. Okay. So again, this is so fucking refreshing. When we're in online discourse and women are being like, how dare you say the fact that I'm like doing a heterosexual marriage slash relationship is like a problem that like I'm participating in patriarchy. Like, don't say that about me. And then you have like the other side who is like, which I'm often on that side. I'm always on that side, basically. But I try to be, like, really, like, compassionate and measured and, like, not inflammatory about it. And realistic. Because a lot of the women on this this other side are, like, not really realistic. The other side is always, like, well, you should be, like, a political... Like, politically celibate. Or, like, you know... Do... Be heterosexual, but, like, in terms of orientation. But, like, don't do heterosexuality in terms of behavior. They're, like, you know... These are, like, the two sides. Marilyn Fry, the way she starts the discussion, and I'm sure it's just a product of the era, right? 
is that she's like, this is not about like who has the most feminist cred in terms of like within feminism. This is like about society looking at women who are non-conforming as you have to be to be a feminist at all. Like you're non-conforming in, in thought at the very least if you're even a little bit feminist. Being treated by society as if they are a problem. You know who universally gets treated like a problem to patriarchy? Lesbians. So she's like, I think that the first part of the essay kind of calls like two points into like question, like that the reader should question these two things. First of all, is that if the dominant power structure, aka men, is looking at two distinct groups and saying, you are a problem, therefore you're the same group. Should we, as the like oppressed group, just take that for granted? I don't think so. So she's saying like, I don't know if that was her point, but that's how I read it. Where she's like, I have all of these women who are in women's studies classes with me, who have experiences of being told the people around them think that they're dykes or they're lesbians just because they're involved in feminism or they talk about feminism or they don't wear a skirt or like they don't enjoy sex or something. So I think it's kind of like a self-own for feminists in this that she's describing to be like, oh, well, the men said that they're basically lesbians. So like they're basically lesbians. Like why the fuck are we letting the men control that or decide that? Bad. The other thing is like whenever I see these like discussions of like, do you have to be a lesbian to be a feminist online? I see a lot of um, women who basically take the position of like, yes. Or you have to at least not be doing the heterosexuality to be a feminist, right? And I've definitely fallen into that but I think that my th now after reading this, I feel like my thinking on this issue has been really two dimensional and obviously that's disappointing, but like here we are. So now we can think about it more deeply. Um, and instead of saying that this is the fault of often the internet discourse falls into basically the lesbians have privilege because they're naturally oriented towards women so that they're like more like their biological determinism like leads them to be more feminist and it's like not fair for them to expect like straight women to be like that. That's kind of like a lot of what the internet argument boils down to. Marilyn is like not even talking about that. Marilyn is like this is a fucking problem of the straight women who claim to be feminists who keep fucking naturalizing heterosexuality. They're the fucking problem because she's like if you guys stopped saying that the only women who are actually radical feminists are lesbians, you would stop creating this dichotomy of like, I think this is what um, Turf Mail was talking about. So this is how Marilyn describes it. Say you are a heterosexual, you know, it's like very tenuous in this essay because we're not believing in sexual determinism, like sexuality determinism in this essay. Say you are a woman who believes and or is acting heterosexual, okay? And you go into a feminism class and you're like, well, I learned about the problems with patriarchy. I already had some problems with patriarchy. So like, what are we gonna do about it now? What's next? Like, seems to me, as she describes in the essay, that like, you know, being isolated from other women in like the nuclear family is bad. Um, using all your like emotional and physical labor towards one man instead of to fellow women, that seems bad. Like having your economic situation tied to one man seems bad. Like, so I'm like some random straight woman in a feminism class and I'm having these thoughts. Marilyn is like, the problem is that when the women have these thoughts and ask the teachers, so what, what next? Now, what do we do? We understand the problem, now what do we do? The teacher's response in general, she seems to say, is to say, you're asking these questions about what you should do in terms of not complying with the institution of heterosexuality. The only women who care about that, who talk about that, who think like that are lesbians. Therefore, if you are going to do feminism in a radical way, you must be a lesbian. And or the fact that you care dictates that you must be a lesbian. Like there's no... Like, either way you look at it, it's like, this is proof that you're a lesbian, or if you're going to do that, probably means you're going to, like, become a lesbian, because, like, you know, 
So she's basically like, the problem is the straight women pushing out other straight women who are trying to be more radical. So it seems to me that in a lot of ways, Marilyn is actually saying, no, the solution is not to be a lesbian, to be a feminist. Like this, this, this question, right? Do you need like, you know, how do you like resist patriarchal institutions that enforce the heterosexual institution without being a lesbian? Well, step one, stay in your fucking group and broaden what your group is. I think a way we can think about this, like an like analogy that will demonstrate this is like, so, you know, femininity, the way to kind of destroy femininity is to stay in the woman box and like throw out the box. So like to say, I'm still a woman, but I won't do femininity. Now we've broadened what it means to be a woman. You can be a woman with or without femininity. She's kind of, I think, pushing the idea of the same thing. Stay in the box of, I am attracted to and oriented towards men. But that doesn't mean I have to engage sexually with men or commit myself to relationships with men. She's saying like, let's broaden the category of women I mean, because that's how I read it, because she contests the concept of, like, sexuality determinism or, like, sexual orientation determinism. And I contest that also. I mean, I've said before in the past that I think all women should, like, unbrainwash themselves from heterosexuality and then kind of, like, assess afterwards. What do you want to do? But I guess that's, like, a little bit more of a weak version of what she has said throughout this book. But... um. The way I understood this, or the way I would like put into practice what we just read, is to say, are you a woman who views yourself as like not part of the lesbian category? Okay, so stay in the category you're in right now and broaden the option, like create a new path for what women in that category can do that is not lesbianism. Stay in your own group and do what your group can do in their own way that is not converting, like it's not a black and white issue. Um... I like that a lot. And the reason I said before, like, I think I've kind of been thinking about this two dimensionally is because I've always kind of thought about it as like, okay, you have two options. One, become a political lesbian, which like, I don't, you know, know. <laughs> or stay in your own group and be politically celibate. That's kind of how I thought about it. I was like, that seems to be the only way to not participate in the institution of heterosexuality, you know, and like give your emotional labor and your like sexual usefulness like a way to a man like that's the that seems to be the only way to do it Marilyn is like let's imagine you don't can like switch to the dark side and become a lesbian <laughs> that's my editorializing she doesn't suppose uh, set it up as a dark side but so like, let's imagine you don't switch sides you stay on your own side create your own fucking path and by doing so you will open that path up to other women who are on the non-lesbian side of things. Um, I like that a lot. Not only because it's like compassionate and non-judgmental, but also because I think it's realistic. Like that's something else too, when it comes to like separatism discourse or like political celibacy discourse online, it's so fucking unrealistic. Like I don't know. I think about right now, I'm thinking about this one woman I know who is sometimes in our live chat, but is not in our live chat right now. I kind of want to text her and be like, fucking come on. She is married to a man. And like, she goes on her own vacations. She has her own space in the house. She like has her own schedule. Like she, she, I think is at the point where she, if today she was proposed to, she wouldn't get married, but she is married. And she lives her life in like an extremely independent way, like extremely independent. And I almost feel like she is what Marilyn Fry at the end describes as a virgin, capital V, because she is like completely autonomous, except for the fact that she already has a piece of paper saying she's married. Like, if we're going to be realistic about what women can do in their lives at this point. That seems like a realistic way for a woman to like enact feminist principles in her day-to-day -day life to try to like resist 
patriarchy because I'm like, let's go back to what I said like 20 minutes. Holy shit, this is actually going to be like two hours to what I said like wifery is. Wifery is like sexual access, procreation, like house labor, and then like being under the control slash protection of a man. The woman I'm thinking about, I don't think that the sexual access thing really applies to her. I'm not going to go into details, but it kind of sounds like she, if she wants it, she doesn't. If she doesn't, then she doesn't. And like, that's fucking it. I don't think that most marriages are like that. I think most marriages, there's like kind of like a push and pull, like a, like a, most heterosexual marriages have this kind of like, you know, you have to make compromises sometimes, like make your partner happy. She doesn't seem to fucking do that. I might be splitting hairs here. I don't like want to get into details, but I think that that, I don't think it really applies that much in her marriage she doesn't have kids she's not doing house labor for him she's like that's your fucking job i do my shit you do your shit it's not my fucking job and the way that she lives her life is like so independent of her husband i don't imagine that she's ever in a situation where she's like doing things because they're sanctioned by her husband or calling on her relationship to her husband to say that like she has you know deserves respectability or that she has protection or something now i might be like kind of you know fantastically editorializing her situation but it was I'm just thinking of this because as we were reading like what would you define as like a virgin in every way except that she's already married to him she kind of embodies like most of the things that Marilyn Fry said here and I was like holy shit so but now my question to myself is I don't know. It's so complicated because like I don't want any woman to be legally tied to any man ever. I don't think any woman should ever fucking get married. Even cohabitating with a man when you become common law depending on where you are becoming common law. It's like just for those of you who don't know depending on where you are. If a woman cohabitates with a man she's in a romantic relationship with by most government's standards in the West you basically become de facto married right? I think even that is risky for women and women should avoid that because it necessitates like certain amounts of legal and financial um, relationships. I don't want any woman to be in that situation. And part of the reason that I often think like the solution to like all of this, you know, do you have to be lesbian to be a feminist in question is like political celibacy is because Any kind of half measure. So, for example, being married to a man but having your own apartment and, you know, having your own schedule and just, like, deciding when you want to have sex with him and, like, present it to him as an option and otherwise never having sex with him. Like, every kind of, like, situation I can imagine where a woman is completely independent and yet married, right? Or, like, completely independent and yet cohabitating. Like, every situation like that that I can imagine, in my mind, it, it, it presents a path to other women and that path is basically a compromise. A compromise that you can do like part of wifery, but not the whole thing. And therefore it's like, you're not really complying with patriarchy. But at the end of the day, we do know that on to some extent you are complying with patriarchy. So I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of confused about what I think about it because I'm like, we need to prevent realistic paths to women that is not complete compliance. But by doing anything that's even partial compliance with the institution of heterosexuality, you are, in a way, making that aspect of the institution of heterosexuality seem benign to the women around you. And that is not helpful. Like, that making heterosexuality seem benign or seem unproblematic or seem like this thing that you can easily control and easily compartmentalize is not realistic. And I think can lead to like you know where we are today women can women seem to think that if you are dating a man but you don't marry the man he doesn't have control over you it's insane to me like i've seen i've been in twitter spaces a couple of twitter spaces that have had these like insane discussions and i've seen quite a few posts on reddit of these women who are like well i'm not married to him but i have his kids so like he doesn't have power over me and it's like yes he fucking does like legally and then you have all these women trying to be like what state are you in what country are you in let me explain to you like how he has legal power over you now how he can use your child to manipulate you now like we're in this insane situation where 
women seem to think the institution of heterosexuality cannot hurt them if they don't get married. And I obviously agree that getting married is like one of the, you know, one of the most concrete ways in which the institution of heterosexuality can have control over you. But it's not the only way. It's like a lot more complicated than that. So I feel like I'm kind of rambling now, but I hope you got my point. I'm going to read the live chat for a bit and then go to like the next section of the essay. So, but basically the section, the first section, she's putting the problem at the foot of heterosexual women. She's saying, you have made your feminism so fucking narrow that anyone who doesn't fall into this, what was the word that she used? She used this amazing word. Patriarchal loyalists. I think that she used that word to mean like these women who are like feminist light. Um, she's like, she's like, they have sequestered like rage, ecstasy, passion, anger, all of these attributes. If you are a feminist that has these attributes, the, the straight feminism is so narrow that you are pushed out of it so she's saying it's at your feet the problem you have made feminism so narrow to women of your category that they are being pushed out of your category just by the nature of their feminism and if you broadened your feminism you wouldn't be like losing women to like this lesbianism thing oh also like worth mentioning that i haven't mentioned so far she's like you're she doesn't say it this way but the way i view it is she's kind of like you're doing patriarchy's work because every time a feminist says, oh, you're doing feminism too far, which in modern parlance is like being a feminazi, right? Like if, like if you are saying that, oh, you're making us look bad, you're a bad feminist, you're too mean, you're too rude, you're too aggressive, you're too angry. Every time you do that and you scare a woman out of feminism, you scare a woman away from feminist thought, feminist action, you are doing patriarchy's work for them of making sure that the only women left in feminism are like this tiny group of women who all do the exact same thing the exact same way by not really challenging patriarchy in any substantive collective way. Um, yeah, okay. I need to go to the washroom. Then I'm going to read the group, the live chat, and then we're going to go to the next section of this essay.
Can you purr louder, please? Okay. I'm sorry to be so demanding and controlling, Momo. Okay, here. Here's your chair. Okay. Okay. I'm going to catch up on the live chat a bit. Momo is like right here. Momo. Say hello. That's her chair. Um, You've watched her female says, I've always thought women choosing to be lesbians was a point of view that would get you into trouble with lesbians, right? I guess lesbians are not a monolith. Yeah, no, um, I agree with that. However, there are some words in that phrase that, like, there are semantic disagreements on. So, depends how philosophical you get about society and sexual orientation and sexual behavior and all that kind of shit. I don't agree with political lesbianism. I'm against it. But like the term lesbian has meant different things. The term choice, right? Depending on how deep you're going into like the social conditioning of women can mean like it's when a woman uses that phraseology, my instinct is not to be like, fuck you. My instinct is to be like, explain exactly what you mean by each of those words. And then I can, like, agree or disagree with, like, you know, that position. Um, I'm sure many lesbians would be like, wow, Benji, so you basically love political lesbians. No, I don't. Um, but <laughs> I, having read more, like, texts from older, like, eras of feminism, I can see now how there are women who use that phraseology who don't mean what the internet rhetoric means with that phraseology. So that's all I've got to, I've got to say about that. Um, I also think when it comes to like into like thought exercises and like intellectual discussion, there's no reason not to have the intellectual discussion about that, even if we don't like it and don't agree with it, which is like where I sit. Um, yeah, exactly. Fossil person says, um, yeah, fossil person basically was saying what I'm trying to say. Okay. Um, Sabrina says, I'm sorry, but women who are attracted to men are actively attracted to sexism. They just want the sexism to, sexism to be more benevolent. Yes, agreed. Um, that's kind of what I was saying before when I was talking about like the socialization, where I was like, we know that no girl comes out of the womb desiring to like have butterfly nails and like, you know, wear stilettos. We understand that that's social. Why can't we understand that it's social for a woman? to experience sexual degradation, which based on a lot of my understanding of feminism and also the women I've talked to who are having heterosexual sex in the year 2023 or 2024, that's a lot of what heterosexuality is. Why can't we understand that a woman's attraction to enjoyment of complacency with sexual degradation is a social thing? I agree with you, Sabrina. And like, it sounds really judgmental and I don't mean it in a judgmental way. I mean it in a compassionate way of like, you deserve better. And that might sound moralistic, but like, I, I genuinely mean like you deserve better. So like, consider why you're okay with that. I don't know. Uh, also person talking about nature and nurture, sexual orientation. Yeah, I'm not touching that. Um, that's not what today is about. <laughs> uh, Yeah, but Sabrina, I think that political celibacy, like, for feminist reasons, is different than celibacy for religious reasons. Like, celibacy, when there's, like, a punishment behind it, is very different than celibacy that's, like, self-motivated, where S Fry mentions this in a couple of her essays, and I, when I've talked to women who are, like, 
you know, heterosexual separatists who are like politically celibate. I've only talked to a handful of them. But a lot of them talk about like how they have like emotional intimacy with women and it kind of like fills the gaps that they imagined they used to be looking for something in heterosexual relationships. Like they're not, they're not, they haven't become lesbians, but like the emotional care that they look for in a relationship and like the support they get like financially, physically, like, you know, all the stuff that they were looking for in heterosexual relationships, they basically like sublimated that with like sisterhood. And in so doing, they have like sustainable, 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 positive, like healthy relationships that keep them going. So it's not like an issue of like deprivation. It's like an issue of like, oh, sorry, not, it's not a situation of them depriving themselves. It's more like a situation of them like, training themselves not to need the things that they view as bad or that they've experienced as bad in the past. I don't know. I get what you're saying, but I think that that, that analogy isn't completely, um, uh, like it's not really equ equative. Kitty cat, I think in terms of referring to political celibacy, correct me if I'm wrong, kitty cat in the live chat says what it's done for me is liberate me from my interpersonal relationships towards my own autonomy. So then shrug. Yeah. Um, yes, I, a friend says, in my opinion, being single should be part of everyone's life at some point, regardless of sexual orientation, because it teaches you how to be independent. Mm hmm. I agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe let's not really talk about that too much because it's kind of a different conversation, but yeah. Oh, you did hear her purring. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Sea Wolf says that now that she's postmenopausal, she's not interested in partnering with a man. Yeah, we don't have to all agree here. Like, um, I, I think it's actually extremely unlikely that we would agree, really. So you will agree with like part with part of what I say, and other things you'll disagree with each other. Like, it's all fine. Yeah, a friend says abstaining from heterosexual sex is like abstaining from self harm. That's kind of how I see it. Um, possible person. Great fucking comment. I don't think this is a subject with a clear answer. Yes. And that is kind of the point of the essay. She's not saying like, so you want to be a feminist and you've considered lesbianism. Here's like steps one to 10 of what you should do. Like she's not, she's not being prescriptive about it. She's like, let's reflect on it, which is what we're trying to do. So I'm not here to be like, this is the answer. This is wrong. This is right. You're stupid. If you think that's not my, no, we're just talking. Okay. Um, <laughs> Momo, look at the camera. Look here. Your fans are watching. She's like, I'm trying to lick my butt. Why are you bothering me? Okay. Um, Let's talk a bit more about the essay. Also, I am so tired. What time is it? Jesus Christ. Okay.
Yes, I agree with you, Sabrina. I This is, again, where I wish we had more language to describe things. Sabrina says, um, I don't support or believe in political lesbianism at all, but sometimes I think when women build a lot of emotional intimacy, they can experience a sort of quasi-attraction. Yeah. I think quasi-attraction is a good word for this because that's kind of what I mean when you talk to women who are like separatists slash politically celibate who are like, I'm not interested in having sex with a woman. I have no desire to go out and like decide to have sex with a woman despite my physical instincts. When you talk to them, they will be like, you know, sometimes I have a desire, like I'm touch starved, but like I'm not touch starved anymore because I have like female friends I can cuddle with or like, um, you know, it's nice to be able to like sit on a couch and like have someone else's skin touching your skin while you watch a movie or something. Like I can experience that without a romantic relationship because I have like female friends and like they don't, they don't, they don't have a goal or the idea that it should lead to anything sexual, but they have like physical intimacy that is like positive and sustaining. And so I think like part of this, I think is kind of like the, the Disney um, myth, like the, the myth of like romance, right? That like, you're gonna find like the one person who like completes you. And then like, you're gonna be like sexually compatible and like a relationship compatible and like career compatible and like everything's gonna be compatible. And then you're gonna like be perfect together. Like, I think that myth is so fucking destructive to women. First of all, because heterosexual institution, right? But also because the idea that you can get everything you need from one person is so fucking stupid and defeatist. Um, and also just in terms of like your entire life makes no sense. Like there are so many women, divorced women who are like, you know who my lifelong friendships are? Like this random girl I met in college or whatever, or like my cousin from child, like, like I think that a lot more women need to kind of like diversify where they get like their physical, emotional, intellectual, social needs met. Like who do you call when you need someone to help you move your couch or something? Is it like your brother or like a female friend? You, like, you know what I mean? Like everything needs to be diversified rather than expecting that you're going to like make one romantic relationship and that person's going to like do everything. I think that's like stupid. So I, I agree with you, Sabrina. Um, Okay. Yeah, okay. So the next section of the essay basically is like this idea that to enact like a female autonomy precludes you from the heterosexual category is like a false dichotomy and that it like fucks with the way that we think and the way that we like group ourselves and behave. Like don't let like patriarchal society put you in those boxes and control you that way. And then the next section. Yeah, so I'm going to read this paragraph because I like the way that she defined it. This is the one where I accidentally ended the entire phrase with homosexuality and I was like, that doesn't make any fucks. Like, my bad. Retake. <laughs> okay. I believe that all feminist theory and practice eventually conveys one to this proposition. That a sensual, constitutive, dynamic, and key mechanism of the global phenomenon of male domination, oppression, and exploitation of females is near universal female heterosexuality. All of the institutions and practices which constitute and materialize this domination and simultaneously organize males' lives in relation to each other either presuppose almost universal female heterosexuality or manufacture, regulate, and enforce female heterosexuality or both. So, what she's saying. The, it's kind of impossible to say that you're living 
by feminist values and enacting practice in your life praxis in your life meanwhile actively engaging in and promoting heterosexuality she's like if you really take our our theory to the end point these two things are in tension with each other and you can't do both at the same time and pretend that they're not in tension with each other that's what she's saying fucking agree then she goes on to explain like you know heterosexuality in terms of like the behavior of men fucking women is like socially enforced a social norm not really an op like it's not optional um which like if you if if every time you hear the term heterosexual heterosexual and every time you talk to a woman who's having heterosexual sex or is in a heterosexual relationship and you don't think of it in terms of where her sexual desire is leading her but in terms of did society set her up for this and she never got the chance or never took the opportunity, depending, to take a second and decide, is this really the thing for her? Like, did she just end up here because society trained her for it? If that's how you view heterosexuality every single time you encounter it, the entire concept of, like, everyone is hetero, bi, or homo, kind of loses its finality. Like, I don't know. I've been reading a lot of this kind of stuff lately. And I found that the way that I understand these words and, like, the instinctual thoughts I have about these words has been shifting recently. Um, yeah, anyway... Oh, then she mentions uh, loyalty to, like, your class, race, ethnicity. Um, but she is also, like, creed, religion, nation, tribe. Oh, she doesn't use creed. Caste, class, race, nation, tribe. And then she says making her willy-nilly. So she's like, if every woman is literally an extension of her man, like a slave to her man, and it's men who just, like decide politics and like engage in politics and women are just like the supporters the appendage of the man right because they don't have power or autonomy or authority to like they are literally just there as like a piece of the man then women have been engaged in like a lot of politics that are counter to the cause of female liberation so in this way she briefly mentions like racism so she's like by engaging in heterosexuality, you're not only fucking over yourself and, like, your own sister and your own mother and your own daughter. You're also fucking over, like, entire classes of women because of the politics of the man that you're associated with. So I think at this point, she's not trying to say, like, oh, you are stupid. She's trying to say, you, woman who is attached to that man, who is enabling his politics and or being exploited to the point that he has more ability to enact his politics. Have you considered... The impact of that and or have you considered how you are not the one who is in charge of directing those politics that the politics that you are participating in non-consensually probably or ignorantly in terms of like your labor is being exploited and you don't really know or care or are not involved in what your man is doing politically that it's hurting other women and therefore hurting yourself. Like she's, I don't know. I just like that she threw that in there because it adds a little bit more like depth to things that are rather than on a one-to-one -one level. Because she is talking about like the institution of heterosexuality like in a macro, but then she like zooms in and is like on a one-to-one -one level. Like what does it really mean for the women, you know? Um, I just feel like she kind of like covered all the bases. I like that. Um, yeah, right-wing women by Dworkin is so fucking good. Um, yeah like I really need to find some literature by black feminist separatists regardless of orientation or sexual behavior or whatever because I have come across women who are like black feminists who will only like spend their emotional labor on other black women who will only do like 
events by and for black women and like they're completely focused on that and some of them view like racism as a problem therefore like black men are like on my side and some of them are like i'm here for and by black women like they are my priority at all times but as feminists we know that like the black men are as much of a problem as every other man so there is like a kind of I don't know, just when she brought it up, I was, like, thinking about, like, these women that I've met, and I was, like, I wish I had, like, a more deep understanding of how those women ar arrive on either side, or, like, how their intention with each other was in their own community. I don't know. Just thoughts, feelings. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, bye, kitty cat. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I like also, like, here she uses, um, I'm going to read this phrase, and, like, if you have read with me, we've read Intercourse and we've read Right Wing Women, right? This phrase will mean something to you from that context. Lesbian feminists have noted that if the institution of female heterosexuality is what, make girl, what makes girls into women and is central to the continuous replication of patriarchy, then women's abandonment of that institution recommends itself as one strategy in the project of dismantling patriarchal structures, this like makes females, makes girls into women. There's another time where she uses a phrase of like, I don't think she uses the term fucking, but she's like fucking makes men into like men and women into like whores or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, this is very like intercourse <laughs> by Dworkin. Um, yeah, so here she talks a little bit um, this next section talks a little bit about, um, yeah, she puts them all in the same category. This is very right-wing women or intercourse, where she's like, I refer to the abduction and seasoning of female sexual slaves, to the clitoridectomy and other forms and sorts of physical and spiritual, that too, spiritual mutilation. Is that what she refers to always as like the fact that women's imaginations have been limited by growing up in like a semantic or epistemic reality that is dictated by um, patriarchy. Like, is that is that what spiritual um, mutilation is to her? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I refer to the diets and exercise and beauty regimens which habituate the individual to deprivation and punishment and to fear and suspicion of her body and its wisdom. Like, and then she puts all beside each other all of which have no cultural or economic purpose or function if girls and women do not have to be made ready for husbands and male lovers, pimps, johns, bosses, and slavers. So I like how she like cuts through the shit. She's like, in every one of these situations, you are the sexual servant of a man. You are the sexual, like, in a subservient sexual position to a man. Whether you view it as, like, the kind of, like, dirty, degrading reality of, like, being a whore, or you view it as, like, the kind of, like, sanctified, prestigious role of being a wife. She's like, no matter which way you view it, you're all in the same category. You've all been led into that direction by the same training from society. Um, yeah. We really need to reread the first book, but, like, it's not going to happen anytime soon because... My life is about to get very, very busy. I think I'm going to have to do only one reading a week. Because, like, starting from two weeks from now, I'm going to have, like, my morning job, my evening job, and then I'm thinking in the middle of the day, like, three days a week. So this reading right now is the, my middle of the day thing. This might become, like, a one day a week thing. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, she... This is like an interesting phraseology that she uses here. So she says, some women speaking in other than lesbian feminist voices. So she she is like acknowledging the different categories without like putting them in tension with each other. She's just like, oh, there's like the lesbian category and the everyone else feminist category. I thought that was interesting. Um, oh, she mentions like that she does think it can be systemic. So... Um, as far as I understand it, okay, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard about, like, declining birth rates 
in um, Japan and South Korea. And as we all know, the 6B4... Wait. Oh my god, my brain. The 4B movement. You know what I mean. Like the release, the corset movement or whatever. Like the no marriage, no sex, no boyfriends, no kids or whatever. That movement. A lot of... Yes, 6B4T. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. The 6B4T movement is, like, responsible for that. Um, like, 6B is, like, a little bit more than the 4T. They also have, like, the no beauty industry stuff, no dieting. It's like, I forget what all the, like, specific the rules are. But women are saying, like, that's why that's happening. It seems to me, based on, like, I don't know what the truth is. Because I don't know if mainstream media is, like, only covering the part of it that's intelligible to like a patriarchal like male valued media the mainstream media seems to say the reason that that's happening in japan is and korea is just because women are like career oriented and don't view it as like financially feasible or wise to have children that seems to be what the mainstream media is saying about why that's happening obviously there are a bunch of women who are saying like this is happening because of like 6b 4t um, I think that it kind of falls somewhere in the middle that just the reality that there are women doing 6B, 4T makes other women kind of have a little bit higher standards even if they're not actually like enacting a feminist practice in their life they're just trying to have higher standards for the men that they hang on as partners and if their standards are even like 10% higher than the last generation the chances of them ever settling down with a man are like so fucking low. Today I saw a news story that there's like 153 schools in North in South Korea where there's not a single first grade class. Like there there are no first graders entering the schools because the birth rate is so low. And to me I'm like collective action is absolutely like impactful and realistic. Can we say we know definitively why all these women are not getting married and having children? No, I can't say that right now with the information that I have. Maybe you have more information than me and you can give me a conclusive answer. But what we can absolutely say is that when women all get it in their mind that some, they want to do something and they all do it the same way at the same time, it absolutely has a fucking impact. Like you see in Korea and Japan that like their federal governments are having like discussions like on the floor of government about this fucking issue. Like they're really, it's a big fucking deal. Anyway, um... Yeah. So I do think that, like, this collective action thing is, like, really realistic. Um, I had very... There was... And I think women know this. Like, um, is it in Poland? I think it's in Poland that there's been a few times where they have this thing. I know other countries have done it, but Poland, I think, is the one who's done it, like, multiple times. Where they do this, like, I forget what it's called. Where, like, a day where, like, the women don't work. They don't make lunch for the husband. They don't watch the children. They don't do the laundry. They don't go to their jobs. Women just fucking do nothing for a whole day. And the whole gun country grinds to a stop. And I think most of the times that they've done this in Poland, it's like um, as a protest against abortion rights. Um, and like that is a great example of how women's collective action is very fucking impactful. Uh during the when Roe v. Wade was overturned in the U.S., at the very beginning, there was a bunch of women saying, like, we should all stop having sex with our men until, like, all the men get up and do something about this with us. Obviously, it didn't happen. Which I think is proof of this whole, like, you don't need to be married to a man to be, like, in the same situation as a married woman kind of thing, right? Um, yeah, I mean, because, like, even financially, like, I, I saw this statistic recently that was, like, I can't remember the exact number, but it was like the vast majority of women who are in domestic abuse situations, the only reason they don't leave is that because um, the cost of housing right now, like it was like a Canada specific thing where they were talking about the cost of housing in Canada right now. And they were like the number one resource women need to leave their abuser is like affordable housing that they can actually access in a timely manner. Yeah. Anyway. So that's kind of like proof that like you don't need to be married to be like in like the wife role. Anyway, 
Okay, the next section of the essay talking about the term virgin. So by virgin, she literally just means autonomous woman. Okay, I'm going to read like the first time where she just defines virgin, okay? The word virgin did not originally mean a woman whose vagina was untouched by any penis, but a free woman, one not betrothed, not married, not bound to, not possessed by any man. It meant a female who was sexually and hence socially her own person. In any universe of patriarchy, there are no virgins in this sense. Even female children are possessed by their male kin and are conceived of as potential wives. Hence, virgins, capital V, um, must be unspeakable, thinkable only as negotiations, their existence impossible. This makes you think of like um, in the Balkans, like in, I'm not going to pretend to know geography, parts of Serbia and Albania, a little bit in Macedonia, there is this concept called the, um, oh fuck, I literally just forgot it. Oh my god. Wait, wait, wait. No, I, okay. Okay. Sworn virgin is the word I'm looking for. In parts of the Balkans, there is this concept called a sworn virgin. In some ways, you might think that that's like the virgin that she's describing here when I describe it to you, but it's fucking not because it's conditional, okay? And it's like sanctioned by society because it fulfills the conditions which enforce patriarchy. So a sworn virgin is a woman who takes on the man's social role. So she can like inherit the father's property, she, this is like, it, they've kind of died out now. This is like a kind of a more historical thing. She can inherit the process property. She can like become apprenticed to like man, the man in her community to like do a male trade. She can like be like the sole provider for like her sisters and um, her, her mother and stuff like that. Like a sworn virgin in a lot of ways takes on like the male role in the family, often because there's no son or because like she is not like, she hasn't been like habituated very well to like fulfilling the female role, okay? So in a lot of ways, it seems that this woman has a lot of independence, but this entire situation is dependent on her staying a virgin and not having sexual relations with anyone, man or woman. So that's why they're called sworn virgins. It's basically like if you stay pure, we will respect you to like the nth degree that no other woman gets respect from us, like society, men, right? As soon as you fuck up, you've lost your status. So I did speak to this old Albanian dude once who was like, some sworn virgins had like relationships with women, but like, because they're not really men, they obviously couldn't get married. And I was like, if you look up sworn virgins, like there's some like documentaries and shit on them. And some of them are like, I knew that I could never have a relationship with a woman because I knew that like it was a condition of me having the status that I had to like be solitary for my entire life. I don't know. So anyway, when I was reading the section on virgins, I kind of like evoked this sworn virgin um, archetype to me. Anyway, um, you know who I'd love to ask about sworn virgins is Max Dashu. She's like a feminist historian. She seems to know fucking like everything about women and different cultures and different time periods and shit. I bet you she'd have a lot more to say about it than I do. Anyway, so the virgin that she describes here is an autonomous woman. And what does she mean by autonomous woman? 
What she means here is like an unregulated woman, an undomesticated woman, a woman who does not try to curry favor with men, get protection from men, get validation from men, a woman who does not try to project her, who does not have, because she doesn't have a desire to be validated by or protected by men, does not try to project that onto other women or expect that from other women. A woman, she, it's so specific, she's like, this woman wouldn't get married even if it meant, like, never having health care. Like, this woman only has sex on her terms. All of her energy is directed towards her sisters. They would only support other, they would support other women. They would never tear down other women. Like this is a woman who is entire, like woman, entirely woman oriented and yet can have sex with men without giving away a part of herself. That's kind of what she's describing. So she's saying like, this is like my imagination. This is like, to me, like this is like the theoretical way in which a woman can be one who wants to have sex with men and yet not partake in the heterosexual institution. But she sets up this entire section by saying that the virgin cannot exist in our society because in our society, there is no point at which a woman is not the property and therefore the resource of a man, right? Like, this is something that um, Dorkin talks about. I'm sure Mary Daly talks about it. Fry talks about it, where even like a single woman who lives by herself and is like financially self-sufficient because of the way our society is set up is still like dependent on man and patriarchal structures, like, you know, consumerism, capitalism, that kind of stuff, and is still like being exploited and used by patriarchy, like paying taxes to like a government that's like phallocratic, stuff like that. So um, it's kind of an impossible thing, but she is like setting up her theoretical version of what a woman could be like participating, sorry, partaking in heterosexual sex, but not participating in the heterosexual institution. Um, Yeah. So that was like fucking interesting. There's this one sentence. It's like its own little like, as you can see, like the page breaks, like it's its own little paragraph here. It says, as these, sorry, are these beings I imagine possible? Can you fuck without losing your virginity? I think everything is against it, but it's not my call. I can hopefully imagine, but the counter possible creation of such a reality is up to those who want to live it, if anyone does. So this is just her kind of being like optimistic, hopeful, like imaginative, where she is like everything that we know in our society says that like to be fucked by a man is to be possessed by him, is to be degraded by him. Given the power structures inherent in any sexual interaction between a man and a woman right now. But does that mean that it's always going to be this way? Who's to say? This is the conclusion in a bunch of her essays where she's like, things are bad right now, but let's like think our way out of it. Try to be out of the box and like give herself hope to like try to do something different. Mm. I'm going to read the very last paragraph and then we're going to wrap this up because I'm so fucking tired right now, guys. I cannot even express to you also oh, what time do i have to be out of the kitchen fuck okay i need to like go like right now i need to i have some cooking i need to do because i'm gonna be away for the weekend so i need to like cook breakfast for next week okay <sighs> i'm gonna read the last paragraph quote do you have to be a lesbian to be a feminist end quote is not quite the right question the question should be quote can a woman be heterosexual and be radically feminist end quote my picture is this. You do not have to be a lesbian to uncompromisingly embody and enact a radical feminism, but you and also cannot be heterosexual in any standard patriarchal meaning of that word. You cannot be any version of a patriarchal wife, lesbian or not, to embody and enact a consistent and all the way feminism. You have to be a heretic, a deviant, an undomesticated female, an impossible being. You have to be a virgin. So, I guess this is kind of what I was saying before, where I was like, there's kind of like the two sides of the internet discourse where they're like, I'm a straight, don't fucking take my sexuality from me. I can still be a feminist and be a straight. And then there's like the, 
I'm a lesbian and like I think that the straights should aspire to be better or whatever that there's this kind of like black and white two-sided argument and I was like I usually fall on this side of the argument but I try to be like compassionate and realistic about it which makes me kind of sound like I'm in the middle sometimes she's being in the middle she's like you don't have to be a lesbian you can uncompromisingly embody and enact radical feminism without being a lesbian and to do so you need to avoid being any version of a patriarchal wife so to do that you can be heterosexual and at the same time be a heretic be a deviant be undomesticated but she's like be impossible so she's like saying that this is theoretical you have to be a virgin aka autonomous um and that's why she said it's impossible because in our society to be autonomous is like in tension with being in a heterosexual relationship or partaking in the heterosexual institution so we don't really have an answer she's like i said this is not prescriptive this is not giving you like real world step by step what you should or shouldn't do but it gives us like things to think about things to reflect on that could impact our actions I know for me, this essay was really impactful. It's I, I've always tried to be compassionate and realistic when it comes to these types of discussions rather than like reactive um, and like inflammatory, which I think a lot of women are, or they get very like insecure in the discussion of like, you know, true feminism being in tension with, um, in tension with heterosexuality. But um <sighs> I know this will like impact me going forward. Um, I might even the next time I see that discussion popping around online, pull up this essay and like look through some parts of it. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna like finish off with some like housekeeping. We're done the discussion now. Yeah, so going forward, I'm going to have a standing obligation on Tuesday after uh, Wednesday afternoons, which as you know, we've been doing streams on Wednesday afternoons. I'm going to have a standing obligation on Thursday afternoons, as you know, we've been doing this on Thursday afternoons. Friday afternoons will be free, but Friday is a day that I have my morning job and my evening job. So like, it really has to be like compact if we're gonna be doing things on Friday. I feel like our reading is gonna slow down to a fucking crawl if we only have one reading a week. So I might try to do readings on either Saturday evenings or Monday afternoons. Both of those days are like a kind of a mess. So that's why I've never really done readings on those days. But if I want to do two readings, Tuesday is like not possible. And Sunday, I will not make any standing plans. Sunday is a day that I leave open um, and always end up getting filled up with things that I have to do. So I don't want to like commit to doing any YouTube things on Sundays. Uh, so going forward, uh, probably just live streams on Fridays. Um, the 18th, that Thursday, I don't have anything. Oh no, wait, fuck. I do have, okay, yeah. I don't know. What I'm saying is that the stream schedule is gonna get changed because my life is about to become a lot more busy. Um, yeah. Which is also why the next book that we're reading is kind of like, I think it'll be really interesting, but I don't think it's going to be like as like philosophically dense. Um, it's a pretty small book. It's like 60 pages long. It is by a political scientist who a friend of mine described as like quintessentially academically political scientist. But this is one of her earlier works. So we'll see. Uh, yeah. Um, some other housekeeping shit. I can't fucking remember. Yeah. Anyway. Uh. I will see you guys tomorrow for the next essay. Okay. All right. Bye. Oh, wait. Sorry. Pulse person says, I really enjoyed all the discussion today. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I don't see anybody else saying any kind of, like, conclusive things. So, yeah. Uh, thanks for coming to the stream. I'll see you tomorrow at the same time, same place for the next essay.